Welcome to our ongoing series of videos on spans and proportions of common spanning systems. We're in Chapter 1, uh, Section 7, and as we've mentioned, we've added a point 2 corresponding to steel, and this is the second in our lecture series on steel spanning members, so we're designating this as B, and this is dealing with steel trusses. Trusses are typically used uh, as an alternative to beams whenever the spans are long and the depth of the structure needs to be really deep. And the very thin, deep uh, sheet web material of a solid web beam becomes too vulnerable to buckling and it's not the most efficient way to carry the load. So here are some examples of simple span trusses. On the top we have a how truss. Um, and, and, and consistent with our usual system, we're saying it spans up to about 100 feet. Uh, its problem is because of the nature of the way it's designed, these web members start to get to be too long. Um, <clears throat> if we go to very long spans, so we need to modify that geometry. And one of the alternatives that we use is a so-called Fink truss, which now uh, eliminates those long compression members at the center and basically spans from there to there with a series of king posts. So we have this sling supporting that post and then this post is supported by that sling and then there's a sling right here that supports that post. And you'll notice all the compression members, the longest compression member is that, whereas up here we had an even longer compression member associated with something that was half the length. So it typically go up to 100 feet with the how truss, uh, up to 200 feet with the fink truss. Uh, one of the vulnerabilities of the fink truss is under wind suction, this element goes into compression, and that is a very long compression member. So typically fink trusses don't work too well if you have a situation uh, where you have a very lightweight ro roof and a tendency towards um, uh, stress reversal under wind suction. Uh, one of the ways of dealing with that is to put ballast on the roof so basically there's always enough gravity force uh, and that seems like an odd thing to do to be doubling your gravity load for example uh, as a way of avoiding the wind load but then the geometry of the structure is so beautifully suited to resisting gravity loads that uh, it becomes worthwhile to beef up the whole the whole truss in terms of its ability to resist that load and then not have to deal with uh, stress reversal that would occur under wind suction. Um, so we're going to talk about how trusses, uh, fink trusses, but before we do any of that we're going to deal with parallel cord trusses which are the most common configuration. They're really easy to manufacture. They work well for floors and can also be used effectively for roofs even though a structure like this one or this one, a how truss, um, shed water better and uh, are even amenable to using um, shingles. Shingles, even in fairly low wind uh, regimes, still need a slope of about 3 and 12. Um, so if you want to use a parallel cord truss for a roof, you have to use some kind of sealable membrane, which uh, often becomes problematical, although it's our most common way of construction these days. All right, so here's a how truss. In the previous diagram, I, sh I showed all these diagonal elements going this way because I like to keep them shorter, but here they chose to put the diagonals on the long uh, diagonal part of the quadrilateral, but basically this is a fundamental how truss where you have a series of verticals that are equally spaced and then you have a bunch of diagonals that fill in uh, to create stabilization. Um, so that's basically this truss right here. And now we're going to talk about a fink truss. This is the basic geometry. So now our compression struts under gravity are this one, this one, and that one. And this constitutes a sling, and that constitutes a tensile sling supporting that compression member. And this constitutes a tensile sling supporting that one. And then, of course, these two compression members, this one and that one, are tied together by this element across the bottom. So everything is fully triangulated. 
in this case of this element, this could have been under gravity, could just be a tension cable. So it would be something so light we barely even see it here. You'll notice in this particular version it has not been rendered that way. That's because this is a greenhouse that has a really super lightweight uh, roof on it. And so the wind suction upward is as problematical as the downward force of gravity. And as a consequence, the Fink truss is not ideally suited to this particular uh, situation, but people really love the geometry and as a consequence, it tends to be used. In this particular case, the maximum uh, snow load would probably be about 15 pounds a square foot since this was in Raleigh, North Carolina. The wind suction might be uh, on the order of that or even higher, maybe 20. The weight of the roof might be five pounds a square foot. So uh, from dead load. So when we account for all those factors, the wind suction, the net wind suction is probably nearly as high as the downward gravity force. But nonetheless, it's a very elegant geometry that was born out of this concern for minimizing the length of compression members and as a consequence, making things more efficient. This is the Fink truss in the roof of the National Building Museum in Washington, DC. It's uh, basically got compression struts there and there and there on one side and compression struts here and here and here on that side. And then of course this element and that element are compression members tied together by this bottom cord, which is in tension. And in this particular building, you'll notice all the compression members have got some thickness to them. Uh, the tension members are all rendered as rods, which means clearly in this structure, there is no stress reversal associated with wind suction, because otherwise we couldn't have this incredibly long tensile element there becoming a compression member under wind suction. And the way this building works is the roof consists of these concrete planks, which are laid on top of it, which span from truss to truss. And those concrete planks were sized appropriately to give enough weight so that under wind suction, there's never any wind reversal. And these bottom, all these elements that are rendered as rods remain in tension at all times. Uh, this is a fabulous building. If you're ever in Washington, DC, you should go see it. I remember when I went there with my son, this is my son right here. He just looked up at this roof and he says, Oh, wow. And then he took off running and that's what architecture should do for people. Okay. So we've talked about the how trust. We've talked about the Fink trust. Now we're going to talk about the sort of meat and potatoes of what we do in most of architecture, which is the parallel cord truss. Uh, which typically is fabricated as a standard double angle parallel cord truss, which will get fabricated for you and all the members sized and the wells sized and so forth uh, by the fabricator. So they're basically not, they're selling you a finished product, which will meet whatever specifications you gave them in terms of span and load. So here's a classic example. In this case, these web members are solid rods because everything involved here is so lightweight that even treating them as solid rods rather than as tubes allows them to work fine even when they're in compression and solid rod bar stock is about the cheapest thing we can possibly buy. Um, you'll notice there's solid rods right through here uh, because of load conditions due to drifting snow load against the facade these members are more articulated and they are basically uh, angles uh, to give them a bit more resistance to buckling. Uh, both of these are completely valid uh, in the domain in which this particular roof is working. Um, you'll notice, by the way, in a key point, these uh, bottom cord extensions are, are welded to the truss in the field and then they're welded to the beam. And the point of that is to keep the, the, the plane of the web of the beam vertical. In other words, you don't allow the bottom cord or the top cord of the beam to buckle out of its plane. Here's another example. Here we have uh, slightly longer members, which have been rem rendered as double angles. Um, and then the top and bottom cords, of course, are double angles. So the double angle webs are welded on the outside of the, uh, of the cord members.
and then the spacer elements between the cord members of these verticals, which are, are single angles that are kind of mashed on the end to give a one inch spacing between the two uh, cord members. And these are pretty minor members. All they do is support this portion of the top cord from there to there uh, under gravity load and they help brace the top cord against buckling upwards or buckling downwards. Um, here we have a, a, a trust tube. It's fully triangulated on the sides because gravity load is a major load. This is a, an escalator in a very tall lobby at CNN in Georgia. Um, Atlanta, Georgia, and the gravity loads are the major loads, but there's a need for stabilization and there might be the occasional lateral load due to um, minor breezes, um, but typically this is an enclosed space. So it's mainly lateral bracing against lateral buckling of the top cords of these trusses and then maybe some lateral movement due to people on the escalator moving from side to side. We tend to ignore those forces, but they actually can be very significant. Witness the Millennium Bridge in London where they saw very large lateral movements which uh, gave birth to an expression called uh, synchronous lateral excitation because people were moving from side to side in response to slight movements of the bridge. People changed their walking patterns and when they changed their walking patterns, those new patterns of walking reinforced the lateral movement of the bridge. So we do have to worry about these things. In this case though, we've just used these moment connections uh, as welded connections. So we've got a Virendil truss or a rigid frame on the top and bottom of this tube and then full triangulation on the sides to resist the gravity load. Um, and this is a similar kind of phenomenon. Uh, we could put a truss under this bridge, but that would be crazy because then we'd have to raise the bridge a lot in order to do this long span. So in both this case and this case, we've kept the structure much more compact by basically pulling the structure up in the aperture. And we will talk about many examples of this. And in the daylighting area, we've already mentioned some. But basically, if you make the truss out of round tubes, it still has enough transparency that you get a view out and plenty of light in, but you're actually walking through your structure. So there's a diaphragm roof, which provides lateral stabilization, a diaphragm floor that provides lateral stabilization, and then the gravity loads are absorbed uh, in these vertical trusses on the side. Once you make this decision to go deeper, your uh, rules for spans and proportions don't really apply anymore because you're not setting the depth assuming that the depth is negatively impacting your um, <clears throat> vertical height of your building or the cost of your building. You've basically said, I have this opportunity to create a really deep, really efficient structure and its depth is being governed by this other factor which is I need enough space, vertical dimension in here for people to walk through. And as a consequence, um, you may end up with a truss that's deeper than some of the proportions that are listed uh, in this table. Okay, we talked in the case of solid web beams about this whole notion that with plate girders we have the option to vary the depth over uh, a point of support like this, which creates an extreme negative moment with compression in the bottom and tension in the top. Um, we can do similar things with trusses. So for example, in the most recent addition to the Denver airport, uh, we have trusses running in this direction, which have already been made uh, fairly deep proportions. And the reason is this is a very high space. And if we use little shallow trusses, they wouldn't even look right. Um, and so the architects have taken advantage of that fact to say, well, we can have a much deeper than normal truss. So this truss probably exceeds the deep limit for parallel cord trusses. And then in addition to that, they've put these special struts. So this is a beautiful fabricational technique because the basic truss here is all prefabricated and delivered to the site. And then these sturdy elements on the side here are fabricated separately and then bolted or pinned at these key points. Um, at the site. 
but the key thing is we've got greater depth of the truss right here from that point to that point uh, to account for that large uh, negative moment or the major compression in the bottom and tension in the top. Um, and we've also created greater lateral stabilization because this very deep truss is grabbing hold of this column in a way that's helping out pretty much everything in this uh, structure because it's so such a tall space and because we don't want the structure to look kind of uh, pathetic is a bit deeper than usual. Particularly these right here in proportion are quite deep but they are part of the lateral stabilization system for the columns and so they're not governed by the usual rules and proportions uh, that occur just under gravity loads. This is a close-up with those uh, uh, heavy compression members bolted on each side of the truss and then bolted to this really nice sturdy connection at the column and this is just another view of what that looks like. Um, we see other examples of this. This is a structure that also had exaggerated depth and then they further exaggerated the depth here over the supports. Uh, in this case it's a form of uh, sculptural expression more than it is. In fact these trusses out here aren't actually doing anything uh, to help hold up the building, um, but they are kind of an expression of a structural idea. We can also vary the depth of a truss fairly easy to do things like create this nice sense of an arch so when you walk through this space your eye is drawn to this curve which people find pleasing but you'll notice the depth of this truss is deepest at the middle and they've also created a continuous smooth slope here which is ideal from the point of view of shedding water. You'd like all parts of your roof surface to have some minimal slope that um, and consistent slope to make sure that you get the water off. That ends our discussion of spans and proportions of steel trusses.